Hey, hi, Satyajit. Thank you for coming uh, to the Analytics India Magazine podcast. How are you today? Hi, Kashyap. I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me in your lovely office and I'm looking forward for this podcast. Fantastic. Uh, so in one of the recent uh, episodes uh, or one of the recent uh, uh, videos that we shot for Analytics India Magazine, one of our interviewer was asking, will AI take over the world? <laughs> what do you I, think about this? I hope not. <laughs> yeah, it's a... It's an overloaded question, I would say, because uh, right now, I think we are far away from that scenario. But at the, the pace at which we are progressing, uh, the human curiosity that is there, I don't see it. I see it, it can happen. Uh, it's just that how, how we put the checks and balances today, I think that will ensure that these things don't happen in the future. So that's my belief. But uh, yeah, correct. And I think what is taking us is like uh, ground ba- groundbreaking innovations there, right? And today we are here to talk about that. Uh, while AI, uh, whether AI will take over the world or not is something very difficult to answer as of today. What do you think are some of the uh, cool innovations that are actually you know making an impact that have a real world impact today? Can we talk about a little bit which fascinate you today? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot, lot of things happening. Uh, I will break it into two categories. Okay, I mean, one is pure tech point of view and one is from the use case point of view. From a tech point of view, I think NLP, in the NLP world, there are a lot of things happening. I mean, every day you see new things coming up. Uh, recently, you would have talk, seen about the text to image uh, conversion, right? Uh, Dali. Yeah, Dali and then image and from Google. Uh, from a tech point of view, yes, that's cool. I mean, how you sense, I mean, how you combine the large language models and the diffusion model to create synthetic images, that that five years back or six years back, if you think of it, it, it was not uh, imaginable, right? From a use case point of view, um, uh, there are two things. Uh, my favorite, I'll, I'll come to that. But the first use case is, uh, since I have worked in the retail, in the, in the retail industry in the past, uh, if you, saw, if you saw Amazon, right? Amazon is pure play online seller, as we know, but they're getting into brick and mortar stores. They're going to have a, a passion apparel uh, store set up very soon. Uh, there, they want the customers to come into the store, uh, which is against their normal uh, uh, way of working, right? They want them to come into the store, take a uh, apparel, a garment, and say, okay, I, I'm choosing a shirt. It'll tell you, okay, what pant or what hat or what shoes will match with that thing, with that shirt. So, uh, and then if you if you say, okay, I want to see how that particular color of that shirt will suit me, they take a photo of your, uh, of your uh, uh, image, I mean, of your uh, body, make a 3D model out of it, and then overlap that particular shirt with that different variation or color and show, okay, how you would look like in that shirt without having, having to wear it. So that's a use case which I felt, oh man, we are uh, getting to a territory where, uh, I mean, online, which is possible, and offline, they're trying to blend in some way, uh, and only Amazon like people can do it at at this point of time. But my favorite is something different. Uh, If you remember the movie Minority Report, uh, it came some 20 odd years back. Uh, If you remember that movie, uh, they vaguely talked about driverless cars in that movie, they had some sort of home automation in that movie, uh, which if you see those technologies are becoming a reality today, right? But what the theme of that movie is, uh, how somebody predicts crimes, uh, which, which is going to happen in the future, and they have a, a, a police unit which will go and prevent it. So just recently I read an article where I think some university in Chicago, they are able to predict a crime one week in advance, and the accuracy is almost 90%. Now, when a sci-fi of 20 or 30 years back becomes a reality, this is what is exciting, right? I mean, what we could just imagine 20 years back is happening real time with such accuracy. And, I mean, these things are only possible because of the advancements in AI and ML. So that that is really fascinating, I would say. Yeah, I think uh, some of the points that you made right now, right? Uh, I think there are three themes around it. One is the NLP, right? Which is where we are getting closer to the artificial general intelligence, like very, very, very close to that, which is also 
uh, fascinating but also scary at the same time uh, be- because i think that is the closest where ai can take over human beings <laughs> but um, i have uh, some okay you anyway, know i have some uh, considerations over there also but fair yeah, enough I, yeah. uh, i think secondly it was the manufacturing uh, where i think a lot of the ai is now manifesting into the physical or the real world rather than just sitting on computers so that is also there and then thirdly you, you i think you mentioned uh, you know an interesting point that 20, the movies that were shown 20 to 30 years back they are now a reality mm-hmm. what do you think from 20 to 30 years ahead now we have the, the inventions now are uh, here but like from 20 to 30 what are some of the things that you are seeing in movies today that will that are there's a, pro, a possibility to make them into a reality okay so uh, okay, again my personal uh, interest would be uh, you know iron man right i mean again i go back to some of these uh, comics so Iron Man has Jarvis, his virtual assistant, right? So when they showed the Iron Man movies, I think I don't know when, ten, twelve, fifteen years back, uh, we we didn't have this Alexa or Siri at that point of time, which kind of like like a subset of what uh, Jarvis does, right? But Jarvis shown in the movie does a lot more things. I mean, he he can uh, of course understand natural language. he can um, understand Tony Stark's uh, uh, body vitals and tell him, okay, you are in trouble. Uh, which today in bits and pieces we do we have variables which can measure our body vitals and try to give us a feedback uh, it can do research for tony stark and and uh, visualize it for him i mean help him visualize that uh, research results we are not we are not having any of it at now today uh, so uh, it can control things uh, i mean we have some kind of home motivation which is a uh, bit close to that but we don't have all of this in one place Uh, and definitely we don't have the wit and sarcasm of what jarvis uh, the way they talk uh, it's very natural uh, there's a lot of uh, sarcasm and wit in his uh, speech which none of the uh, voice assistants today they, they have it and it's very tough to build also i mean it's not easy to build that kind of uh, uh, intuitive way of talking to somebody right that doesn't uh, happen uh, yeah i think you talk of wit and sarcasm right and th- i think they have classified you know this augmented intelligence into three kind of stages so first one was passive where you just tell yes or no then it was generative right. which kind of predicts and then intuitive i don't think we have any systems that have reached the intuitive stage right so what would it or have we i don't know <laughs> but like what would it take to actually reach that stage where ai is intuitive yeah i don't think we have reached there yet uh, in my opinion uh, you talked about the uh, um, artificial general intelligence right where uh they like something like gato gato model which does 600 tasks i mean it can uh play games it can uh stack up lego blocks it can caption images so many so many different tasks a single model is doing which is great i mean earlier models were like single task based models right so here we have something which is doing 600 tasks but how did it learn to do these 600 tasks i mean uh, if i give one more task to it it's not able to do the, the 600 first task based on what it has learned for the 600 task which still needs a bit more training a bit more data to uh, uh, to know the 600 first task right so there's an interesting paper from yan lee kun uh, our chief uh, ai scientist from meta he he released a paper very recently uh, it talks about the path to autonomous machine intelligence so he says uh, it's very interesting paper i mean you must read it uh, he says why are humans different from machines right Uh, the the ability of humans to learn and understand the world today uh, there is no machine in its current capability which can match that okay uh, you if you take like a driverless car i mean you you have to feed a lot of data points to it uh, it has to go through a lot of trials of reinforcement learning to understand that uh, i should not accelerate when i reach a curb okay but a teenager when he starts to how does he learn a Her learn driving, right? He takes twenty to forty hours of uh, driving practice, and is able to fairly uh, drive decently on the road, right? With those twenty to forty hours. So why does it take such a long time to make a machine uh, to learn, right? So what he says is that uh, human beings don't learn a task in those twenty to forty hours. Okay, from the beginning of their from the birth, they understand the world, uh, and they start building knowledge a knowledge bank. Uh, uh subconsciously consciously they try to build a knowledge bank 
and it is not to whether to learn a uh, driving a car or to ride a bicycle agnostic of any task it learns just small things about the world okay i mean these things add up over a period of time and then when you learn something like driving a car you know intuitively that yeah i i, do, I need to brake at while i'm reaching a curve okay so it's more of common sense at that point, point of time machines so he says he has formalized a way how to get there i mean i don't know how it how uh, i mean it, it uh, how to make into reality he says the machine should should have some kind of a world model which means that uh, the machine should be made to learn uh, to understand the world through observations not through trials just to, through observations it will keep learning the i mean about the world it will keep abstracting it okay and and keep abstracting to a higher level where it has a big picture okay once it has a big picture at that point of time if it learns a few tasks it can it might be able to intuitively do some other tasks but for that of course there are a lot of mathematical constructs it has to i mean just to be devised to i mean abstract the world in a at a higher level right but that's a way that he thinks and and it's a long way to go i mean it again goes back to the first question you asked me right uh and it is scary also i mean once it knows intuitively to do certain things you don't know what it can do also right yeah so that's a scary part about <laughs> no which is which is where i want to ask you later as well that should it be intuitive which we'll discuss in a bit but you know i think one of the things that you said was uh to make it intuitive uh you know there is there is a there's a long way to go before we actually reach there uh Absolutely. today with all the intelligent applications that we have they say that ai is not even more intuitively intelligent than a dog let's say like right? they joke right. about it that yes, way yes. uh what do you think uh you know uh, so how and today even 55% of the models that are there in the world today they are mostly uh, according to a 2019 survey i think is 55% or, or around one out of two applications just remain on shelves right that's right yes how do you choose the right cases when you want to innovate right so for instance if you are setting up something of an r&d lab or right. you want to an innovation and development lab what is it what does it take to choose a, a use case how what are the factors that you need to consider i mean you absolutely made the right point we we can at times do innovation for the sake of it uh, and say okay yeah I mean, it's possible I, i'll do it because my curiosity has made me do it but i think when we become more uh, uh, when we try to say okay is it having some kind of impact uh, social impact or economic impact that's where we i think our focus should be what is the problem you're trying to solve how do i reach out and benefit to the society in large is my innovation really uh, helping that cause i think that's i think those use cases which make that possible i mean for example what we do uh, in our company uh, at ladle uh, we try to uh, imbibe the best of scientific journal into our education system and try to give the best learning experience to the healthcare providers so that they can do a good job of saving lives okay now our use case is okay we have a mixture of hardware and software to do it now how do i scale out how do i reach out to the maximum people so that more lives are saved so that's where technology comes into play i mean can i have say a digital twin of our hardware and use it to simulate uh, uh, situations that can help our providers so i think we have to pick and choose and see what is the benefit uh, social benefit is one big factor of course economic benefit is a big factor there can be negative uh, effects of what we innovate also but if the social and and economic factors outweigh those negative aspects i think we should focus and invest heavily in those uh, use cases I, it's in my opinion i would say yeah i think it's uh, it's important uh, i think you make a very interesting point right May taking care of social or social economic impacts of ai model which is where i want to ask you uh, my next question you know uh, how do you responsibly innovate uh, when it comes to so for instance you said that if the negatives uh, kind of overpower the uh, economic profits that it can make then probably it's an innovation not worth pursuing right not it's absolutely but then what are some of the factors that need to be considered when it comes to uh, you know uh, innovating something through ai and what when do we put a stop and say that you know what we we should not innovate this um 
I think we should have like checks and balances, right? I mean, um, as I said before also, right? I mean, if we are looking at general intelligence, we never can predict what they can start doing, okay? Uh, so I think checks and balances should be there. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I think some companies are already doing it. Uh, is there fairness? So we collect, we have, we need data uh, for training, we need models, all those kind of things, right? Uh, is the data that we are collecting, is it fair? Uh, so we have heard of a lot of instances there, okay, uh, a company has some hiring system and it is discriminating against uh, female candidates, right? Or the healthcare system in certain countries, uh, it, it uh, kind of ignores the, uh, the, minor, the socially backward classes. Uh, and that's all because of data, right? I mean, humans are biased, machines are not supposed to be biased, but it's ultimately humans who are feeding data to the machine, right? So I think it is responsible. I think fairness is a big, uh, I think awareness is there nowadays. So we should have checks and balances where we have, okay, is it fair? Uh, is the data secure? Is it, um, uh, is it in, I mean, intruding to the privacy of the, uh, the people who, from whom you're collecting data? In healthcare especially, uh, when we work with uh, patients and we're trying to help them in saying, okay, I'll collect your data, I'll try to see whether I can diagnose some disease early. But in that, when I, while in the process of collecting data, am I intruding into his privacy? Uh, am I not careful with the data that is that is being collected? That's a big uh, challenge. Sometimes you don't even know what is the risk. So uh, yeah, which is where I was going to come next, right? Fairness and accountability maybe for small tasks are okay, right. but when it comes to something like AGI, we don't know what the future holds. Right? Should we put a hard stop and not innovate then? See, I don't think we can ever put a hard stop. Uh, there will be folks... Uh, Why not? We we, th we, saw, we thought that plastics are harmful. Now we have banned single plastic use. Right. But when we were in... Probably when we were inventing plastics, we were not... We didn't predict it and did, did right. do that. But then this kind of... Can be very scary, right? What the rep uh, implications of such a system it, are. It is scary. Uh, I mean, most of it is speculation, right? I mean, uh, of course, there is a bit of speculation and... But again, see, it, it's all built on, if we don't do it, what are the positive outcomes of that? Nobody knows. Uh, it can have some, as I told you, right? I mean, uh, we have a lot of global problems. Uh, can they, they be solved? Uh, because global problems are at scale and, and maybe something like this can help us. Uh, but how do I put checks and balances? I think that's our responsibility, how we... Uh, put the right checks and balances and ensure that something of that sort or if something happens how do we recover from it uh, can we recover can we have a override i don't know I don't but know prevention answer. is better than cure right prevention is better than cure but when we are speculating things we don't know I, I, which we say that yeah i mean it's scary it's good to speculate only uh, when we speculate and say it might happen then we can put checks and balances but if you don't try it out, we don't. We'll never know. It's it's uh, the, the purposes it can serve. That can go. Uh, maybe we might miss out on uh, certain things. I mean, that's my thought process. Uh, but I think as as human beings who are naturally curious and inquisitive and want to make it work, uh, I think people will find a way to get it done. But I think the onus is on us to ensure that. It doesn't go out of hand. Yeah, I think also there's enabling innovation. Kind of is much more than just. Uh, people who are interested in inventing technology there's a lot of stakeholders involved yes right so it's not simply that this thing but if so since we could now know that you know in the last uh, 50 70 years we have made such uh, drastic technological improvements Absolutely. and we have realized the impacts that it can have then does it become ethically a bit of a uh, this thing to and e even even if you put policies right we have, we have worked with putting policies and this thing they on, on a broader spectrum they don't work right in a broader scenario when when and especially the world that we are living in today mm. if profits always have marred uh, ethics right so yeah, right. is it I don't know I, I mean we can't stop it but then is it is it, are we are we are we go, going down a scary path then we we might be going down on a scary path, but I mean, again, if you see um, some of the the uh, if you weigh the uh, the kind of pros and cons, right? Uh, of course, we have regulations and law and uh, who 
find we constantly see fines being imposed on companies for for uh, uh, not being able to comply to those whatever regulations we have today right uh, the only thing is yes uh, like tesla car okay i mean we have done they have done a lot of testing we still see crashes it leads to fatalities uh, those are the things which if you are not anticipating uh, what can be the intended harm that a technology can provide if you are not able to anticipate that it becomes a problem uh, tesla cars if they want in a in a rush to say okay i mean our cars can do uh, semi automatic or automatic i will enable it and let them do again it comes to human beings to decide whether to go fully automatic or semi automatic or or they say driver assisted right so i mean it's a, it's a tough question to answer i would say yeah. uh, it it needs it needs awareness and uh, i think people should be made aware of what can be the potential implications uh, uh, especially uh, people now everything is kind of made public right i mean it's democratized to such a extent that anybody can get into ai right now a person a layman his entry barrier to ai is very very low okay so but he may not know all the implications so how do i train him i think if you are able to train a person of that caliber we might be safe i don't know we can still get into wrong hands and i go. i think i slightly disagree on you on this and i'll tell you why right accessibility to technology as such it's fairly uh, i think dependent on a lot of factors while people might be accessible to it understanding or even something as educating someone in terms of what this technology means right, right? so many countries are coming to india now uh, and there was a recently study that i read uh, it was trying to understand how indian data can be used to develop models in europe okay. right german this thing okay. and that's the thing i don't think we are digitally that literate to understand that there are policies being developed or being studied where data can our data can be used to develop a model in some other country and economically benefit them right. it's such a power imbalance but i think that's fair uh, i understand the point that you're trying to make uh, but in terms of this right responsible innovation uh, we also talked about while we should develop or not develop we all talked that there are some positive implications of it so how do you ensure accessibility to this right uh, that is my last question to you and like that is very important if we are making these cool innovations mm -hmm. how do we ensure some people are not left behind okay so uh, see again this you, i mean for example uh, when you see the innovations happening around the world uh, for example just give an example of the covid 19 Uh, vaccine program right i mean we developed vaccine mass produced but there are some countries in the world which did not get it okay i mean uh, some of the back back i would say some of the backward nations were not having access to it that's of course because of the economic disparity that is there uh, that's always going to be there in any technology uh, at any i mean uh, you say but the stakes are very high when it comes to ai the stakes are very high uh, the stakes are high but this at the same time ai is uh, can solve global scale problems okay which means i can make solutions which are cheaper see the the main reason it doesn't reach out to uh, different parts is maybe the the cost of it the cost uh, or the way it is uh, scaled it's not reaching out to people but ai has potential to make those things happen which actually breaks down the barrier for okay i mean can a backward nation get it yes it might be this given to it in for for free i mean it can reach that that point of at that level it can reach it's only us humans who might prevent it i mean i don't think it's a technology which would uh, say okay no there's a limitation ultimately it might be the nations who decide okay where where the benefit should go okay i mean that that we see it in every aspect of life i would say uh, so again onus is on humans to make sure these benefits reach out to every section of the society uh, i mean for for example and the vaccine is the best example right i mean ai is enable vaccine development from research to market in the shortest span of time uh, it takes 10 years or more for for a vaccine to be developed and approved for covid it happened in like less than a year i mean uh, that's all possible right but what 
prevented it from reaching out to the rest of the world it is not the ai actually it, it is some other factors outside technology which prevent it right so uh, again it is it's a mixture of both uh, i would say uh, technology of course is to reach out but i think education awareness uh, the social responsibility of people uh, if it reaches others it will benefit everyone that should be the mindset everyone should have and uh, i i think those are the i mean there's a lot of awareness that needs to be that needs to be uh, out there policies around education probably you know, or education one thing but even awareness so again when i say when you democratize ai people are uh, it's like a black box for people right i mean but if you don't play around with it you don't you'll never know the benefits of it so uh, so when people know the benefits they say okay why should i not get the benefit why should i not enjoy the benefits of ai i think that is something that i feel people should at least play around a bit and understand the benefits before they really uh, decide okay ai is it is ai for me or not before they just say no i think ai is too scary i don't understand it they should not say that they should be aware of it and then say okay yeah i mean uh, i know what it can do maybe it doesn't fit my use case well and good but if you are if you know it and then say no that's a that's a fair enough decision but otherwise you should not be scared of the the uh, technology as such okay so if i had to put my bet on if ai is more scary or humans i would always put humans but sad thing is ai is developed by humans <laughs> exactly so <laughs> no yeah i mean it's like a chicken and egg problem right what, what is uh, <laughs> so it's ultimately i think it's the onus is always on humans to to control the creations uh, of of humans it has to humans have to know basically so we have to be responsible and i think if we as humans take responsibility i think we can direct the energies of ai into a lot of good things so is my opinion okay on that note thank you so much satyajit thanks for your time. thanks thank you